Contemporary computer gaming is the perfect combination of every art form the human race has ever created. 2D art and texturing, 3D modeling, music, sound effects, science and maths too if you want to call those art. Not only is it a combination of these arts, but it's also an art you experience. The amount you enjoy it is largely down to how much control you have over it. And today I want to give you a brief history of how audio and sound has evolved in computer gaming. I know some of you are going to get all hot under the colour for me mentioning certain games and apparently ignoring others, so any games that are chosen as examples for a particular console or era are completely arbitrary. Some games are chosen because they have a particular noteworthy audio or noteworthy soundtrack, otherwise no favouritism, so just deal with it. So, the earliest video games from around the late 50s were completely silent. The first game in which audio was included was Pong, released in 1972. Gunfight, released three years later, included a handful of sounds, including a mono gunshot. The Atari 2600 was released in 1977, and the nine game cartridges featured primitive audio, rumbling tanks in combat, and the rhythmic bleep bloop of Breakout being two examples. Space Invaders from 1978 included the first audio you could arguably refer to as music. It was a repetitive thud that increased in tempo as you progressed through the game. In the early 80s, one of the best ways to enjoy video gaming was in the arcade, where you'd play a single game on a dedicated machine. 1983's Dragon Lair was the first game to include stereo sounds and real voice acting. Unfortunately, the home release version of this game couldn't quite match the quality of the arcade version. In 1985, the same year in which we become subject to Tetris and Alex Pajitnov's hypnotic score, the world was introduced to Koji Kondo's score for Super Mario Bros on the NES. The music shifts with the on-screen action, quickly becoming integral to the gameplay. Seriously, try playing this game without the audio, it is not easy. Nothing happened in 1987, maybe something about a Final Fantasy and the Legend of Zelda? Something about setting the bar for video game soundtracks. I don't think anyone really cares about either. Anyway, Sega launched a huge campaign in 1989 to promote its new Genesis system. Featuring heavily in said promotions was Michael Jackson's Moonwalker, part video game, part music video. In this game, you play as MJ prancing around to his own hits looking for children to save. Oh god, cover it up, quickly. In 1993, Nintendo released the 16-bit SNES. The system uses a dedicated 8-bit Sony SPC700 sound chip with 8 separate sound channels. Here you can see Super Mario World, which is a great example of this system in action. Around this time, Panasonic and Sony made strides toward making CD the standard for home gaming consoles. You can basically fit more on a CD, that's all you need to know. In 1993, Atari built upon this with its dual 32-bit Jaguar, able to produce CD quality sound with full stereo effects. And here our example game is Rayman. Okay, fine. 1994, Final Fantasy VI, the music was well good. Sega released its 32-bit Saturn in 1995. The system employs two sound processors made by Motorola and Yamaha. That same year, Sony released the PlayStation, complete with a 24-channel sound chip to provide CD-quality stereo sound and support for digital effects. Here you can see Wipeout XL, which allow players to choose what track to listen to during gameplay, including contributions from the Chemical Brothers and the Prodigy. Nintendo 64 launched in 1996. The 64-bit cartridge system relied on a particularly powerful CPU to handle the music and sound effects. And here you can see scenes from The Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of What's Name, and this is one of the first games to include music making as part of the gameplay. Thrasher, Skate and Destroy was released on PlayStation, which upped the ante for licensed music in games. Included are Public Enemy, Run DMC, Grandmaster Flash to name just a handful. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater was released shortly after as the Punkleganger, that's Punk and Doppelganger, which featured music from Dead Kennedys and Primus. 
The PlayStation 2 was launched in 2000 along with the 128-bit Emotion Engine CPU. The system boasted 48 channels of sound plus 2 megabytes of dedicated audio memory, meaning it could play more sounds at the same time and at a higher quality. There was also some kind of Xbox around here somewhere. I've actually never heard of it, so I assume no one cares. Anyway. Now we're at an interesting point where the quality of and immersion provided by video games is only limited by a player's hardware. For instance, most games are now released with surround sound audio capabilities, but you only get that if you have a surround sound system. We've got such advanced tools for creating and playing games, the fact that it's only taken us 40 years to get here is crazy. We can pretty much have any quality of music we desire, which has led to many major titles employing Hollywood film composers to score their work. We also now have third-party applications for integrating audio and music into games like FMOD and WISE. These dedicated programs are only limited by a sound designer's imagination or by what they think a gamer can handle. Games like Guitar Hero and Dance Dance Revolution brought music to the core of gameplay. Regardless of our opinions as gamers and musicians, they did. Some of them even gave us crappy plastic instruments to use as controllers. What's interesting here is that the success of the soundtrack in the game is a direct result of whether or not you you're any good at playing it. So before we leave, these are our modern soundtrack or audio picks. First off, Portal. Kelly Bailey's soundtrack brought the sterile scientific environment to life. Also, Jonathan Colton's Still Alive was a very good call. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go search that. Saints Row 4, the dubstep gun. <laughs> Yeah, so that's a thing that happened. Lastly, Morrowind and Skyrim. Hands up, I never liked Morrowind that much, so sue me. However, the score was one of the first things that got me into Skyrim in the first place. It's just heroic in all the right places and very nearly disappears for the moments you just want to explore. Amazing score, amazing implementation of said score. So that was music history for this month. Please continue to subscribe, like the video, share it with your friends, comment with any suggestions for future videos, or if you want to comment and tell us we're just straight up wrong, um, do that, whatever. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.